Good afternoon. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my honor to welcome you to the speaker series event, Conflict Prevention Through Societal Integration, a conversation with Lamberto Zanier, OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. This post, the High Commissioner on National Minorities, was established in 1992 by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe as an early conflict prevention tool focused on ethnic tensions involving national minorities. While such tensions are regrettably a perennial concern, this issue seems particularly relevant today when many observers have noted the increasing influence of nationalist discourses uh, worldwide. Nationalism in global politics is nothing new. The nation state is the cornerstone of the international rule-based order and the multilateral system. But recent years have witnessed the return of a strident nationalism set in opposition to multiculturalism and global cooperation. On every continent, politics based on the affirmation of national identity and uh, the exclusion of minorities is on the rise. This is, um, to say the least, troubling from a conflict prevention standpoint, because while historically nationalism contributed positively, in part to processes of decolonization and democratization, it was also behind some of the great crimes of the 19th and 20th century, and remains a potential cause of division in any multinational setting. Indeed, indeed, by many measures, ethnic tensions are rising. The OSCE is unique, to my knowledge, uh, that it has a high office to address these tensions from a conflict prevention perspective across its 57 participating states. The High Commissioner on National Minorities has a mandate to alert the OSCE to risks, providing early warning and early action where a situation has the potential to turn into a conflict. And a critical part of this are thematic recommendations from the High Commissioner on how policies of integration can help ease tensions and help improve effective participation of all members of society in public life. Ambassador Lamberto Zanier became High Commissioner on National Minorities in July of 2017. This came after having served two terms as OSCE Secretary General between 2011 and 2017. Before that, he spent three years as UN Special Representative and Head of the United Nations Interim Mission in Kosovo. Previously, he was a career diplomat in the Italian Foreign Ministry, serving in senior positions at the Executive Council of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and as Head of Disarmament, Arms Control, and Cooperative Security at NATO. So he brings a wealth of experience and expertise to us today. He will speak for about 15 minutes or so, uh, and then I'm ask him a couple questions from uh, the stage before we open up for Q&A. Uh, but before we get to his talk, we will see a short two-minute video about the 2018 Max van der Stoel Award given by the High Commissioner and the Government of Netherlands, which provides a positive example of conflict prevention through societal integration uh, by youth, um, in, um, in this case through the opposition to segregation. Uh, enjoy. Bosnia and Herzegovina stands at the crossroads of cultures. Its diverse people have lived side by side for centuries. Conflict following the dissolution of Yugoslavia in the 1990s emphasized the divisions between people. Government policies built upon differences perpetuate rifts within the country. However, from the little town of Jajce, in the center of the country, students are writing their own narrative one of unity rather than division. A group of high school pupils of different ethnic backgrounds were unhappy at being separated from their colleagues and decided to oppose the decision of the cantonal authorities. 
They openly protested the establishment of a separate school using the slogan segregation as a bad investment. Ci danas želimo, ali ono apsolutno da tražimo ukid sistema dvije škole pod jednim krovom. Da se ovako nešto nebo buduće događalo. A year long campaign including street protests and letters of objection led to an unprecedented victory that stopped the establishment of the separate school. Based upon the actions of the pupils, the planned segregation was put on hold by the authorities. Yaitsa, however, remains the exception to the rule. Schools throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina remain effectively segregated, perpetuating divisions for future generations. The example set by the recipients of this award can serve as a model for others, including policy makers at government level, to overcome barriers towards the integration of society. I think it's nice to start on a positive note. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Ambassador Zanir to the podium. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, thanks to IPI for uh, hosting me uh, today and to Dr. Lupel for uh, his kind introduction. Uh, this, uh, <coughs> this video gives you a bit the theme of uh, uh, the topic for which we have come this time. Uh, which is, uh, uh, yes, conflict prevention. My mandate is a conflict prevention mandate. Uh, a mandate that, uh, as Dr. Bell was pointing out, I feel is as uh, relevant as ever. Uh, because if we look at conflicts today, uh, conflicts of which we uh, um, uh, invested so much in uh, uh, policies of uh, prevention and on which there is an increasing attention on uh, uh, the need to strengthen preventive diplomacy, uh, we realize at the same time that those, those policies are primarily aimed at preventing interstate conflicts. But if you look around, interstate conflicts are increasingly rare, and conflicts tend to come from within countries, within societies, split societies, and uh, very often because of uh, the impact of geopolitics, uh, we see external players influencing uh, or supporting uh, various parts of the society in, uh, in the context of a, of a crisis. So what we see today is extremely complex uh, conflicts uh, where it is difficult to intervene for the international community, but which is also very difficult to prevent. One of mo the most effective tools to prevent uh, that kind of conflicts is really working on strengthening the resilience of the society itself to uh, crisis and conflict. So making uh, societies uh, more stable, uh, making societies more inclusive, uh, more peaceful, and, uh, um, and investing in a stronger degree of integration. Um, these are uh, elements that uh, are part of my mandate, in, in a way. And uh, uh, we are going to present this in the UN in an event that will take place in the margins of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, high-level political forum on, the, on sustainable development uh, tomorrow, um, uh, bringing this team and bringing a number of other regional organizations to share with them our own, uh, our own expertise. But this year, one particular uh, angle that we've taken is the role of youth, because youth as uh, beneficiaries, uh, first of all, youth as an interested party, they are the ones in the society that have a long-term perspective and that every interest uh, to live in a society that is stable, that is prosperous, where they can find the place where can, uh, they can play a contribution. But also young people, and as you've seen in the, uh, in the movie here, um, uh, who uh, understand uh, that they need to uh, overcome uh, the division of the past, uh, to take a future-oriented approach uh, uh, to addressing difficult issues uh, in a context where the older generations tend, in fact, to look at the past and tend to stick uh, to patterns that very often are partner, patterns of uh, division and, and segregation. Bosnia and Herzegovina is an example of that. And uh, if schools continue to be segregated, and if kids uh, continue studying 
uh, on the basis of curricula that are not exactly the same, with textbooks that are not exactly the same, even if it's the same school, but then if you belong to a certain ethnic group, you are in the left part of the school, and uh, if you belong to another, you're on the right part of the school. And then at the end of the school cycle, you will look at the kids studying the other side of school as a group of people who are not entirely friendly to you, and uh, as a group of people that have created trouble and have uh, uh, played a role in the, in the conflicts that have taken place in the past. So young people do understand that that is not in their interest, that they need to overcome the divisions of the past, and they need to invest in a future that is a future of uh, integration, of uh, coherence in the, in the society. Uh, and this is why we decided, uh, and this was a decision of a, uh, of a panel of members uh, of, of the jury of this uh, award that we showed, uh, to make of this a model, an example uh, of uh, uh, how young people are fighting, finding lots of obstacles, including at home, including in the families. And the, uh, and the structures and all that, in the streets, fought to study and to be together and to build a new, better society together with their friends, regardless of, uh, of ethnicities. I think this is a powerful message, and that's why we wanted also to bring it out here and to, uh, uh, and to communicate it to others. Um, uh, working on integration of societies is uh, uh, obviously uh, not easy. It, it touches on uh, uh, issues that are extremely sensitive, uh, uh, delicate politically, um, uh, and that often are seen as a departure from uh, established order. Um, this takes place in a phase where we see increasingly identity politics uh, prevailing. Um, in a phase where we see uh, geopolitical relationship uh, becoming, uh, becoming more complicated, and where we have to take into account all the, these elements and try, uh, in spite of them, uh, to find constituencies that help us implementing our policies. Over time, we have focused and we have identified a number of areas where we need uh, uh, where we need to, to operate. And we have issued these uh, guidelines that Dr. Lupel has mentioned earlier uh, that deal with a broad range of issues. And, and the first one uh, is a set of guidelines on education. When I started my job, I was surprised myself uh, to see the prominence of, uh, uh, of the education uh, uh, sector in, uh, in my activities. But in fact, uh, if you have a segregated uh, uh, education system, you will have the germs of segregation and of division down the line in the country. We will perpetuate the divisions that exist. So you really need uh, to invest in models of, uh, of schools that bring the various uh, uh, actors and the various parts of the society better together. And there are many elements that play there. There are countries that are not so much in the case of Bosnia, but in others you have linguistic groups. So how uh, do you balance the need of uh, a minority or an ethnic group uh, to study uh, or to at least start studying its, in its mother tongue, but then as they progress uh, uh, learning more of the state language, the official language of the country they live, so that they can play a fuller role uh, in the society of the country as they uh, uh, advance, as they develop in the, their own professional careers. Uh, so equal opportunities for all starts also from a balanced uh, process of education, which does not cancel the identity of those who are different. Differences and, uh, and, and diversity is a richness for the society that should not be eliminated. It should, in fact, uh, uh, one should invest in, in this diversity because it's, it is a richness. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, avoid that this diversity then becomes an obstacle. Uh, for access of individuals to, uh, to the society. So education, language is another topic that, that we uh, uh, focus on. Um, the rule of law area, uh, just think of policing or justice. Uh, if you have uh, a sense that, po that police or the, the law enforcement organs are discriminating people because of their ethnic or religious belonging or whatever, then this will lose credibility. This will uh, lead to a loss of credibility uh, of the of the overall rule of law system. The same, of course, in, in justice. Uh, so promoting 
a full participation of everybody in the society uh, to the law enforcement uh, um, apparatus, uh, to the, to the, uh, in the justice sector, and making sure also that there is no sense of discrimination when it comes to the, uh, the way these organs operate, is key, is very central to the credibility of the uh, institutions of any, uh, of any country. But this is obviously uh, difficult. So as we work uh, with countries addressing their um, security concerns, and to take one among many is the issue of uh, um, uh, radicalization and violent extremism. One of the things we see is that if there are groups that are not well integrated in the society, then you have a higher likelihood of seeing uh, because of the segregation in the society, of seeing marginalization and then radicalization and then potentially violent extremism. So working on uh, strengthening the inclusiveness of the society is also a very effective tool to prevent uh, this kind of uh, security challenges that we, um, that we face as, as we proceed. And then we have guidelines that regulate also relations between countries when it comes to minorities. Because there are countries that feel that there are compatriots living in, uh, uh, in neighboring states or in other countries that need to be looked after. And that's entirely justified. And uh, uh, those people themselves feel that there is uh, uh, a, a country outside that is a country of reference for them. And they, they are interested in the culture in many aspects of the life of the country. But then they live in a different one. So even finding there a balance where Yes, a certain degree of assistance and help by the so-called king state uh, can take place. But if that assistance then starts complicating the process of integration of this community in the country where they reside, then we have a problem. Uh, because then that becomes an interference and then this will make the society of the country where the different community uh, resides uh, 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 more complex and, and the society more dysfunctional. So even there, there's a fine balance that needs to be, uh, to be found. And, uh, and these are some of the things that we, uh, that we look into as, uh, uh, as we uh, operate on the ground. My mandate is a, is a mandate that is based on quiet diplomacy, as we call it. So I travel, I look at where there are difficult situations, I talk to the governments, I give advice based on these uh, uh, on these sets of guidelines that, uh, that we have developed. I look for constituencies that can, can help. Youth is, is one of those constituencies, and this is what also we want to uh, invest more in the future on. And, uh, uh, and then I try to engage with also other actors that, that can help. So part of my job is to identify the issues, uh, to uh, see where there is, uh, I, I'm trying to avoid issuing, even, even though I, I would have the power to do that, to issue informal early warnings about potentially dangerous situations. But I draw myself conclusions as to what could develop in a dangerous uh, uh, direction. And then I do approach uh, the relevant actors and I pass the messages that need to be passed. But the other side, which is more public, and it's related also to what I'm doing today, is to better uh, inform uh, the public, governments, etc., about these rules of the game that we have developed, these recommendations. They are not legally binding or anything. They're really based, uh, uh, first of all, on best practices that we have observed, on lessons that we have learned, on things that worked and things that didn't work, uh, on advice by uh, eminent academicians. There's, there's, lots, there's lots of capacity and expertise on, on all of these issues around. So it's a matter sometimes of uh, establishing uh, networks and identifying uh, uh, sets of issues that, uh, uh, that require attention and, uh, and then communicating what are the things that have worked in other, in other places and encouraging governments to, uh, uh, to or discouraging them from uh, 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 making policy calls that would uh, then create frictions within their uh, their respective societies. So it is, in a way, in, in, an old but new conflict prevention tool that is really interesting, that seems to work well in this, uh, uh, in this environment. It's long term, because really working on stabilizing societies uh, is something you need to invest on to have long term uh, stability. And, uh, and one of the things we are trying to do also here in the UN, we have uh, 
set up a panel inviting a number of other regional organizations from the African Union, the Arab League, the Organization of American States, etc., etc., and, uh, and informing them about our own findings and encouraging them to reflect themselves uh, on uh, uh, strengthening or including in their own toolbox uh, uh, also tools or policies that go in this uh, direction that will help them stabilize potentially uh, uh, dangerous situations in, in, their own, in their own areas. So this is in line also with the Chapter 8 uh, approach in the UN Charter, having regional organizations supporting the UN, because first of all, our uh, first interlocutor is the UN, uh, the UN is a partner in even organizing this event, so they're really uh, uh, looking uh, with interest at what we are, we are doing and drawing their own, uh, uh, their own conclusions, and we're working with many parts, in fact, of the, of the UN system. And, uh, uh, but also using the UN as a platform to, uh, to pass on to others. And I think in future there will be, because of the global challenges, and you know, look at migration, and you can look at it from one angle, you can look at it from one other, depending on where you sit. Uh, but, but you need to have both angles in mind and, and look at it. And as we deal with migration, and uh, sorry, with um, uh, minorities and diversity of the societies and the integration issues, even the migration challenge becomes uh, 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 very relevant, even though there are some who call migrants, uh, in a way, the new minorities. I don't go as far as that. But, but in fact, some of the issues that we, address, that we uh, deal with do apply also to, uh, 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 to movements of people. And in a globalized world, in today's world, and with the challenges that we have, we, we know that there will be more and more of this in the past. So we need to equip ourselves with the tools to address these issues. Maybe I will leave it at this. I don't want to, uh, I, could, uh, I could mention many other things, but maybe we leave them for, uh, for a chat among very ourselves. Good. Good. So thank you, thank you very much to all, and I look forward also to having a bit of a debate. Great, thank you so much um, for, for giving us an overview of, of, your, of, of your role, of your office, of the challenges that you face, um, and, and this, this critical point about, about looking at conflicts today and the tools that we have to prevent them, that in the past most of our tools were related to, to interstate conflicts, but what we're seeing today are more in, intrastate. Um, and the, the key to prevention then is, is helping to build the resilience of societies to conflict. Um, and you mentioned the, uh, of course, you're one of the things you're doing here in New York today and, and the award um, uh, that you highlight is to work, working with youth. Um, IPI has been doing some, some work on youth recently. I mentioned to you before, uh, earlier that the, uh, our 49th annual Vienna seminar was on uh, youth as partners in prevention. And key to that, I think, is um, understanding uh, youth um, as part of the, the present solution to, to future conflicts um, and, and also uh, present divisions, that they have a positive role to play. You, you mentioned that uh, some of the critical areas for integration of societies uh, that you work on issues related to education, language, um, rule of law, and justice. And it, it, it occurs to me that, though um, it's been said by others, not just by me, but that you know, youth often, the first experience that people often have with the state is through the education system um, or through the justice system, uh, uh, for better or for worse. And so policies that, that address those areas um, can have a profound impact on, on how those communities relate to the state uh, in the future. Um, could, you, could you tell us a, a bit more about wh how, how are you working with, directly with youth um, on, on, on some of these areas? Uh, I have to say, we, we have a number of, uh, uh, as we, as we focus on the on the policy areas that I mentioned, we have various programs on the on the ground, and some of these programs are addressing exactly youth in education. By definition, mm -hmm. uh, we work uh, we work with young people, work with the schools, with the teachers. But uh, but uh, uh, the the role of the youth is essential for us also to understand what are the needs and what requires what needs to be done. Uh, but there are other examples. I was mentioning these uh, Lund uh, recommendations, perhaps in a discussion we had earlier. Uh, on uh, inclusion of, uh, uh, of diversity or inclusion of minorities in public life. Mm. And there are many areas where this inclusion is essential. Uh, one is uh, 
the political sphere. Uh, so we, we have uh, in Georgia, just to mention one, uh, one case, a, a program uh, that is uh, um, addressing young people from minority communities, Armenian, Azeri communities, etc., that tend to be isolated, where people enter into politics locally, and uh, and it, it's political processes that are based on uh, on local uh, dynamics. And we bring these young people in the capital, and we make them, we give them internships with political parties, mm -hmm. and we encourage them to become part of the larger political process, large political discourse in, in the country. So helping them uh, embed them without changing their own uh, or affecting their own perceptions, their own uh, security concerns, but simply allowing them uh, to channel them and to mainstream them in the policies of main political parties. And so bringing them apart. So these, these are examples where uh, we feel it is important to invest on the young people because they have the longer term vision of the things that are needed uh, to invest in young people that come from minority uh, communities uh, so that they bring also these particular perspectives and the set of problems that they have in these communities and to ensure that they are enabled to transfer uh, these the perceptions but also to bring their own objectives uh, and translate them in, in, in elements of policies of uh, mainstream political parties. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, areas where we really invest on, on young people. We recognize the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, empowering young people. One of the problems we find in working with, with youth, of course, is that uh, youth is a, how can I say, uh, it, it's a concept that doesn't is not reflected in any particular structure. So it's it's very difficult to find the right interfaces. So you really need you need to get out and to in whichever sector you work to try to mainstream in what you do also uh, role of young people and making sure that uh, uh, you don't you're not selective in terms of the generation you interface yourself with and and make sure that you encourage uh, some interlocutors to be there and to engage uh, also from the younger generations because mm -hmm. those are the ones who bring the really long-term perspective that we're interested in. Yeah. Well, um, this, uh, this example makes me think something that we were talking about before. You know, um, uh, one of your predecessors, Ambassador uh, Volbeck, was here a number of years ago. Um, and in preparation for the event, I went back and looked at some of the, the things he told us about your mandate. Um, and um, you know, he commented that you know, he regularly commented on seemingly internal matters. You mentioned you know, working with youth to, to help them into political parties and such. This is something that um, would often in other multilateral settings create a, a lot of pushback that uh, uh, you know, you shouldn't, that's an internal matter. Why are you uh, discussing this? What, what's different about, about your office that, that allows you to, to comment and engage and this, at, at this level? What, and what sort of, what sort of constraints are, are you under? Uh, my, my mandate gives me quite some latitude in terms of uh, uh, choice of topics, because as, you, as mm. you will have gathered from the issues I mentioned, it's, it's really broad. Uh, an element of protection that my mandate gives me is this confidentiality we're talking about. So I can reassure governments in terms of uh, let's discuss about some difficult issues. And from my side, rest assured, I'm not going out to the first uh, newspaper I find and give a big interview about this sensitive issue that we're discussing. Uh, so I can maintain a degree of confidentiality when it comes to uh, uh, some of the issues that are considered to be how can I say, strictly internal and, and potentially politically sensitive. And, uh, uh, and this is giving me an edge in a way. Uh, it's a matter also building the trust and the confidence between myself and my interlocutors. Uh, so this is why also I have to travel a lot. I need to engage with people. I, they need to know me and they, they need to trust me. Mm. Uh, and then the, the more trust I get and the, and the more I get traction uh, also in seeing some of the recommendations that I put forward implemented. As I was saying, these are recommendations. These are not, uh, uh, how can I say, obligations of any kind. Uh, 
so I need uh, I need also to convince people that that's that's the right thing to do. Often uh, I see that working with administration and with ministers, I make quite some mileage. Then I see laws that are based on the advice that we give going to parliaments, and then I see parliaments turning them around. Mm. Uh, so there is also in the OSC we have a parliamentary assembly, so we are also working with the parliamentary assembly. I do meet also with parliamentary committees, etc. But we are operating in an environment where there is uh, uh, a stronger political polarization. You see it even here in the US, but you know, in most European countries, including my own in Italy, uh, this is unfortunately the state of affairs. So, so you can come with some very wise and solid advice, but then uh, uh, having it implemented becomes, uh, 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 becomes not the easiest of things. So you need also to build coalitions of, of actors who can uh, uh, help you and, and be convincing, and in some cases also uh, have a little bit of a higher profile. Uh, not necessarily putting anybody on the spot, but talking about the issues and the policies and the importance of making sure that certain policies are, are followed, that certain, uh, um, uh, um, how can I say, best practices are taken into account as function, as models that have functioned, uh, that, that, that have given results. Mm. Uh, so, but certainly the environment in which we are operating now, it's much more challenging than, uh, than what we had, uh, uh, let's say, in the phase immediately after the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the 25 years of the, of, the, of the office, has there ever been a, been a case where a member state said, the High Commissioner is not welcome here, which has happened with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for example? In the um, a proper niet, I wouldn't say, <laughs> but uh, there have been cases where we wanted, uh, and my predecessors wanted to visit countries, and these visits were delayed. Mm -hmm. I myself have visited countries where my colleagues were telling me last time we were here was like 12 years ago. And uh, after that, we didn't manage to come anymore. Uh, so now I'm, I'm finding an environment where I can... I can travel pretty easily everywhere, mm -hmm. but uh, partly that is also because of the job I had before. I'm known, I built relations, and so that helps mm -hmm. me in a way. Yeah. There is also a personal side to that. Yeah. Good. I, have, I have other questions, but I think we'll open up the floor uh, um, for uh, other, other perspectives. Yes, all the way in the back, please. And uh, all the way in the back, no? Yeah. And please uh, uh, give us your name and uh, yes, uh, hello. for the webcast. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Laura Gagliardone from uh, UNICEF. Thank you very much for the presentation. I had a question regarding uh, how you disseminate the thematic recommendations. So if you have like a dissemination pr plan, a communications plan or so. Thank you. Great. Can take, uh, yes, uh, Gay here in the second row. Thank you very much. Gay Rosenblum Kumar from Peace Direct, a small NGO that promotes local peace building and peace builders inclusion in policy. I was very interested to hear you speak earlier about OSCE trying to convene other regional organizations to discuss similar work and best practices. Um, and I wondered if those events are conceived of as including civil society. Uh, so as to look at youth and civil society as potential allies and not spoilers or criticizers. Thank you. Okay. And yeah, okay. you just pass it right over there to the next, yeah. Yes, Yadira Soto from the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C. Um, I recall when, when this position was established and over 25 years ago, <laughs> yes, okay. um, I met some of your predecessors. And the reason that I was interested in the position is because in the Organization of American States, we do not have an explicit mandate for conflict prevention or for tensions within society. And I was trying to share this model at the OAS for quite some time. But my question is, in these last 25 years, um, what would you say has been the biggest challenge on a, on a practical technical level or on a quiet diplomatic level and in an institutional level? Because um, these are the best practices and the lessons learned that other multilateral organizations need to hear 
And um, so I'd be interested in, in knowing if you guys, if, if the institution, if the organization has systematized over the last 25 years this very unique role of the High Commissioner for Minorities. Great. Thanks. Three, uh, three excellent questions. How do you disseminate your guidelines? Yeah. Yeah. Inclusion in civil society, and just a small question, what, are you, what have you learned over the last 25 years? <laughs> okay, let's start on the dissemination. We are a regional organization, so our work to communicate uh, on, uh, on the guidelines is a work that takes place in the space of the, of the OSCE, with the exception of, we'll talk about later when it comes to the other uh, international organizations. Uh, so what we do is that we do uh, periodic events on, uh, on the guidelines. Uh, sometimes we launch new ones, but it doesn't have to happen necessarily. But in my time, we launched two, one on access to justice and one on uh, minorities and digital media. So the, the impact of media on minorities, which is another sensitive and complex area, uh, especially looking at media in the digital age. So, you know, social media and all that, which does have, have an impact also on the discourse, etc. Um, so w we have these events uh, to which we invite representatives of the uh, member states. Um, uh, everything is online, so it can be downloaded, etc. Then thirdly, we do trainings uh, as we um, organize activities. In, I mentioned Georgia, but in any of the countries of the OSC, uh, we work, say, on the with the judiciary on, or with the police or with the Ministry of Education uh, in Central Asia, we have a big uh, regional program on multilingual education, which is important to make sure that all the minorities are included in the explaining how uh, curricula can be built uh, to take into account the linguistic needs of uh, minorities while promoting the state language. Uh, so, so we have all these trainings in, in many places. In some cases, we also have... Uh, uh, institutional setups, for instance, in South Serbia, uh, in cooperation with the, a Serbian university of Novi Sad in Vojvodina, we have set up a department in South Serbia, which is an area where there is a strong Albanian community, and there is a faculty of economics that we are, I'm the uh, uh, chair of the stakeholders committee of this uh, faculty, uh, where Serb and uh, uh, Albanian uh, kids study or students study together, so they follow economics uh, uh, courses at the university there, this faculty, uh, run by professor of Novi Sad, but also with some uh, professors coming from the Albanian speaking areas, either in North Macedonia or Albania proper, and, uh, and, and, learning, and learning together. Uh, the Serbian language being the, the mainstream and the, and the biggest investment in making sure that they learn in that language. And these becomes, they become also good models uh, for, uh, for other places. So there is a promotion within uh, the organization. And then when I provide, when I talk to uh, uh, the, the permanent council uh, of the OSC, which is whatever, the equivalent of the General Assembly here in New York, uh, which meets every week, and, and periodically I go there and I report about the guidelines, their implementation, etc. Uh, but certainly we are investing more in making sure that they're well known, well known by the practitioners, but also well known by the legislators. Because as I say, sometimes uh, we see legislations that are not in line with the recommendations and uh, we want to make sure that there is an understanding by those who pass laws that in fact they are departing from what we consider a good practice. And so if they do it, they do it with reason. Um, the other uh, organizations is a recent development. It started last year when I got an invitation to a, an event in Uganda uh, organized by an NGO or rather a coalition, intergovernmental coalition called GMAC. And uh, it was on prevention of genocide uh, they invited me to speak about the guidelines and how we prevent conflict, and of course genocide being a, a consequence of a conflict, uh, through our own thing. And I went there and presented some of these, we have the Ljubljana guidelines, on, uh, uh, we, which is a bit of a recipe of what you need to work on to have a, a, an integrated society. It shows all the sectors and the areas, etc. It's a kind of an umbrella set of recommendations. And the number of representatives from African countries were in, and the, the African Union 
were really uh, interested and were saying, we have nothing like this in Africa. If, even if one of our leaders wanted to invest in uh, um, uh, overcoming uh, ethnic uh, divisions in the society and strengthening resilience and strengthening integration, he would know that there's no blueprint. He wouldn't know where to start from. And so I told them, well, this is what we do. And of course, we're not here to teach anybody, but you can look at what we do and you can draw from, uh, uh, you know, looking at what we do, you can draw conclusions for, for, for yourselves. And there can be things that we do can, can be useful for, for you. In this kind of events or in the events we organize thematically, uh, we do invite civil society and, uh, and interested civil society organizations. Sometimes they put them uh, on a podium and they can, uh, they can intervene. It's events that we organize ourselves, so for which we take, uh, we take responsibility. When I travel, uh, I don't talk only to governments, but in fact, civil society for me is a key uh, interlocutor because I uh, very, op very often I hear very different stories and this allows me also to raise issues that are relevant in my contacts with the, with the governments. Um, in the interaction, however, with uh, the regional organizations, I'm, I'm representing an intergovernmental organization, so we keep that in, a, at an intergovernmental level. This is why I also wanted to do this event at IPI, because I was slightly uncomfortable at having this discussion tomorrow in the UN building only at the presence of uh, uh, you know, in intergovernmental organizations. I, I, I feel that I need to reach out to a broader constituency. And I'm glad to see that there are here uh, uh, organizations that are representing NGOs, that are representing civil society, it's, uh, it's important. Now, um, OAS, first of all, it's good that the OAS will be represented tomorrow. We just heard Ms. Talamas is coming, so she'll be one of the panels uh, tomorrow intervening. And, uh, and it's good that we have this, uh, this discussion. I'm, uh, 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 really pleased to uh, uh, find out that we are being observed from outside the OSC mm -hmm. area. And there is uh, uh, attention for, for what we are doing. Um, the, the point I would make is that, as I, as I was mentioning earlier, what we do is long term. It's really trying to observe. There are some initiatives that are, you know, uh, how can I say, very visible, including the, the film you saw earlier. We thought those students really uh, deserved uh, the, the prize and deserved the mention, and and it's important to communicate this kind of successes when uh, when we see them. And we don't want to take any. Uh, uh, the only merit we have is to recognize what they did, but it was really their doing. It was not uh, something that we did for them, apart from promoting the concept of uh, stronger integration and uh, in the schools, etc. But it's it's one of those things on which you need to. Uh, work all the time, and uh, and if you don't see enough progress, you need to go back. Uh, my, my job is not an HQ job, even though I'm based in The Hague, but I'm rarely in The Hague because I feel I need to be on the ground and talk to the people and talk to the government and move things uh, forward all the time. And of course, where I see a potential for a crisis, that, that's my priority. But there are many other places where I, I, uh, I feel, I sense that I need to be there because there are so many issues that are uh, potentially provoking crisis. Something we were discussing earlier with uh, um, uh, Dr. Lupel uh, that I, I didn't mention in the speech is what we call, and it's very sensitive and difficult, what we call memory politics. Mm. And uh, we see uh, in our societies, and, and the more we see identity politics, the more we see accents on, uh, uh, how can I say, selective interpretations of history that often is the history of the majority. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, bringing up what we call the mirror of pain and pride, because what is the pride for some and for the majority can be the pain for the minority, a defeat in history, etc., and the interpretation of that battle. And often there are commemorations, there are monuments, there are statues of heroes, etc. And, uh, and these things become, and the narratives behind that, become tools also of conflict. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we see it in Europe, interpretations about uh, the, the Second World War still lingering, or some interpretations about uh, the conflicts in the Western Balkan or in the post-Soviet space, or some of the crises there, and the different readings of those. 
uh, the crisis we have with Russia now. And if you hear the Russian narrative, even behind the crisis in and around Ukraine, is so uh, the difference with the Western narrative is so stark. And, uh, uh, and this influences the public opinion. And then, and then the symbols going with that. And we see in Donbass, as you know, the OSC is engaged there. And we see fighters that bring symbols uh, and they carry on themselves symbols of the Second World War. And they're still there uh, fighting against uh, uh, the, uh, uh, how can I say, fascist institutions of, uh, uh, of Ukraine after the coup and so supported by the West. So there is, there is a narrative there that has also its own set of symbols. And you need to be aware and to try to deal with that. And uh, uh, so addressing also often very difficult and sensitive root causes of, uh, of this crisis is so important. So the, I would say that very rarely there is one thing that you solve and then the problem is, uh, is gone. And it's even difficult to, to think of one. But there's always plenty of material for you to work on and to choose from uh, to select your priority, say, we need to sort this out to improve a bit the situation. From there, we'll see where we go next. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, here, uh, Jake, in the second row. Thanks very much. Uh, Jake Sherman from the International Peace Institute. Uh, you have talked a lot about the fact that much of the, the framing for what you deal with in many ways is, is looking backwards in the past. You just mentioned the, the legacies going back as far as World War II. I'd be interested in a moment when much of Europe is racked by growing nationalism, growing xenophobia among OSCE members and, and migration, which was an issue that you mentioned in your opening remarks. How well you feel that your mandate has kept up with these changes, and to what extent you feel there might be scope to, to update it? Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I had a question. Um, I'm with the Russian NGO. We don't necessarily do peace um, work, but what I realize is that um, the issue of indigenous people, indigenous languages, for example, in Russia, that's something that uh, presents a bit of a controversy to the government, <laughs> in a sense that they uh, consider the indigenous people, in some cases, the support uh, to the indigenous people as a potential cause for secession on the basis of linguistic and other uh, uh, characteristics. So I'm wondering how much does your division, how, how much of priority do, does your division uh, pay to this, uh, give to this? And also, what do you think the role of peace education in issues like this would be? Thank right. you. Thank you. I could take one more right now if, if anyone wants to jump in. OK, we've got, got two big questions there to grab. So my mandate, first of all. Mm. Uh, it is, in a way, an old mandate. And the, the mandate comes from uh, the end of the Cold War and the appearance of new states and the internal borders becoming international, dividing communities. So we needed a tool to promote, in a way, policies uh, of integration of those groups that were somehow separated by, by the rest, by these new borders. And in many cases, those borders created conflicts, and some of these conflicts are still unresolved, of course. Partly also because on top of the dynamics uh, that you see within this, this situation, there's the geopolitical factor and the, and the role of, uh, of uh, some of the uh, larger players in relation to those, uh, to those conflicts. So these remain complicated things. Um, something I'm very wary of, and, and this started well with, the, uh, with the first High Commission, is the definition of minorities. And I try to steer away from it as much as I can. Because I have plenty of countries in the OSC who tell me we have no minorities. Uh, minorities are defined in the Constitution. There's only one or two or whatever. And you look at them, and others who say we have no minorities. You look at societies that are extremely diverse, uh, even historically uh, diverse, but, but this diversity is not recognized. So I, I rather focus, I rather go thematic. And I look, how do you deal with education? How do you deal with whatever, the policing, etc.? How many representatives of this region who speak a different language are part of the police, even though they are not a minority? 
And, and in that practical way, I manage, in fact, to engage also in situations where I, I might face a formal objection that this is not in line with your, uh, with your mandate. Um, there is a third element, which is the evolution of the societies. And uh, some talk about the new minorities, in a way, as the impact of migration. And there, I do a bit of the same. Uh, so I, I try to see how this uh, can apply, these uh, uh, recommendations can apply to these new situations. There, however, I have a bit of a geopolitical problem because, uh, uh, because of the traditional focus on, uh, of my work, which is mainly uh, on post-Soviet or post-Yugoslav or Southeast European areas. So as I start moving into, you know, so in the direction of more established, uh, democratic, uh, whatever, uh, societies, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, of a special attention to what I'm doing exactly. Uh, and uh, even, even here, I, I came here and I had meetings in Washington with civil society, with a number of uh, uh, parts of the administration, talking about justice, about policing, about education or whatever. And uh, without, you know, any, any uh, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, long-term strategy, but just to inform myself and to use it in the discussions and to raise issues in, in, in the context of my consultations. I feel I need to sort of uh, explore how far I can go in interpreting my own mandate. Ideally, the mandate should be updated. Everything in the OSC is agreed by consensus, so the chances of having an updated mandate are close to zero. So I'm not even going down that path because, uh, uh, unfortunately, in the OSC, it's, in this moment, it's very difficult to agree things. But as I used to say when I was Secretary General of the OSC, it is much, as long as you build a, a, a good, trusted relationship with everybody, it's much easier to do things than to agree to do those same things. So you just go out and act on things. We have these guidelines, we have these thematic things. You go out, you engage, you talk, and, then, and you find out that there is quite some space for you to pass on messages and to look at what's happening and to comment and then try to influence. Uh, so it is a different way of operating, maybe, but, uh, but it, it expands a little bit and allows us to interpret creatively the, uh, the way we operate. Now, uh, on, the Russia, uh, on the Russia side, next week I will be in Russia. I'm going to Moscow, and then I'm going to Kazan. And I have a set of meetings there, and a number of issues, uh, uh, including in the area of education. I heard uh, last time I was in Moscow last year. Uh, I, went, uh, I met the deputy minister of education, so I was, uh, I was discussing uh, education policies there. Uh, I have to say there is a strong investment in education in various languages. I think they mentioned 23 languages of, of instruction in Russia, depending on the nationalities. And uh, with Russian as, you know, the, the, the state language, but still with space and often also choice of the communities on how much they want to study in their own native language and how, want to, and how much they want to study in Russian. So this is what, was, uh, what I remember for those, uh, from those meetings. But then I want to go down on the ground and discuss. So this time we picked uh, uh, Tatarstan uh, to, to begin with. And I'm planning in future maybe to move also in other directions. We, we, will, see, uh, we will see how it, uh, how it goes. The, the agenda there is, is a long and complicated one because obviously there's the Russians abroad and there are lots of, uh, uh, lots of issues that we have to, uh, to talk about. Uh, but, but I think it's good that, like here, also in Russia, I'm allowed uh, to, to talk to people and to, there will be contacts with civil society, so I will talk to the administrators and to the authorities, but I will also try to talk to the people. I will give a, a, a small talk at the university, so talking about these things and communicating also uh, to, to the people and to the young people. Uh, also some of our policies and some of our recommendations. So we move in many, in many directions. There is, there is attention also, also for that. And uh, I, I think we are finding enough space also to move and to engage uh, in the direction of trying to better understand uh, the, the, the problems of the various communities, in, in, including not the traditional minorities, but also the indigenous people. 
Yes, please. Uh, hello, good day, um, Ambassador. My name is Milena Stošić and I'm coming from the OSC mission to Serbia. I'm a youth focal point there, so obviously my comment slash question will be uh, regarding youth. I'm thrilled that you underlined the message that we need to do youth mainstreaming in any given sector. Nevertheless, this is really done rarely. Um, I believe it's still a very young um, idea that this should be done, I mean, globally, not only in our region or, or in the OSC's work. In the mission to Serbia, we started developing a very comprehensive approach to this, hoping to, to have a full package on how it's done in order to first make our infrastructure able to do so and to, to walk the talk also in our work with others, such as with national minority councils, for instance. And my question in this regard, given that um, you have always been very supportive towards youth participation as Secretary General, now as High Commissioner, what can be done for organizations as ours so that youth mainstreaming is a systemic approach and not maybe only recognized by um, individuals who see value in this? And then more concrete, can we perhaps hope uh, to see in the work of HCNM um, long-term program which deals with youth mainstreaming with different national stakeholders such as national minority councils or anything other related to enabling more youth political participation? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I want um, maybe a, a bit following up on that and some of the other, the other questions. I mean, um, youth mainstreaming, youth participation, it, it, it does, um, you alluded to um, the recent guidelines that the HCM and uh, M put out on media in the digital age. It is obviously something that is extremely important uh, to youth, but but more broadly to this issue. The issue of hate speech and instigation of violence um, is is one that that many uh, countries are struggling with and the private sector is struggling with. Um, you put out the, the most recent uh, guidelines and I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe tell us a bit about what your advice has been uh, to member states and, and others about uh, how to navigate this, this difficult terrain. On, uh, on uh, you mean on digital media or? or on, digital, on digital media, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, f f first, first of all, on uh, youth, it's not, it's not an easy question to, to, to answer, of course. Um, there's always a gulf between the intention of what you manage to do. One thing that I feel we should invest more is, uh, is encouraging young people to uh, and empower them uh, to engage. Because often uh, we need to go and look for them. And, uh, and uh, it's not always easy. Uh, so mobilizing uh, young people, and that has to be also self-mobilization. So people like you, who have the job of... Uh, uh, in a way, carrying the flag of uh, of you know youth networks and the role. Uh, I think your your role is very important because of this mobilization that I think is uh, is required. Um, uh, it's important to communicate that there are uh, responsibilities that are connected also to the to the future. I think that challenges we face today are really long term uh, challenges. Uh, uh, that require uh, that kind of vision that people that have the whole life in front of them uh, can can have best, and so we need to empower them to play to play a role. And we know that it's difficult because uh, 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 because of power structures and then you know the environment in which which we operate. So what we can do is to try to facilitate through programs like the one I mentioned earlier in Georgia. And certainly, we can try to think how we can multiply this and, uh, and do it in more. The only limit is the capacity of the institution. You know, we're a relatively small institution. And the, and the second problem is that it's easier to do it when, and sorry for the OSC terminology, where we have field operations. So we have a presence on the ground. We can mobilize also a network and we can uh, launch programs where we don't, it's more difficult because we don't have the point de repair to, to start looking at, uh, at but, but certainly maybe using the parliamentary assembly, if we want to look at the political area, the parliamentary assembly of the OSC and the program of internships, uh, we can try to make it uh, 
institutionalized everywhere and uh, and promote it that's something we can discuss with the uh, with the parliamentary assembly we can partner with them and and try to make it uh, a standard program for all OSC countries and through that bringing youth into mainstream politics and uh, and give them an opportunity to uh, 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 to play uh, to play a stronger role so these are some of the of the things that we could uh, uh, we got in mind for the rest i'm happy to sit down and discuss uh, over you know a coffee or, or a glass of raki or whatever and mm. and and think and think how we can uh, uh, um, uh, how we can improve that um the question of uh, youth and, uh, and media. Well, not necessarily even youth. I mean, uh, just uh, thinking about the talent guidelines that yeah. were produced in February, and thinking about um, the presence, the the presence of hate speech and, yeah. and other mobilization through social media that is being used uh, in the political sphere um, to uh, sow divisions between national minorities and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and governments and 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 another and otherwise uh, instigate violence it, by and the way it plays both ways mm -hmm. because what we've seen with social media is that they can also coagulate in a way trends that can be unhelpful mm -hmm. something uh, you know dealing with minorities sometimes I'm seen by minorities as a protector of minorities mm -hmm. but my mandate is not necessarily one of uh, fighting for the rights of minorities. Yes, of course, it is. And where I see rights of minorities violated, I do intervene. But sometimes minorities forget that they also have obligations, which is mm -hmm. obligations of integrating the society. Of the, there are minorities that resist integration. They want to preserve their own things. They want to live in their own corner, in their own environment, and do the, and, and not really play their full role in the society. And, and sometimes social media can encourage that, because they, they become... Uh, uh, environments within which they encourage themselves and push back uh, towards. So you need to also look at it from that uh, from that perspective. The third element, which is an element of concern that we have, is uh, is fake news, mm -hmm. and is the fact that uh, through social media you can inject information that may distort, uh, even in a subtle way, the, the mm -hmm. picture and may influence attitudes also in relation to these processes of... Uh, and so we bring in many of the other guidelines, including the role of uh, neighboring states, because, you know, when you talk about media and social media, you don't really have borders. And so you, you can have also influences, and you've seen debates here, for instance, uh, mm. uh, related to elections. Uh, you can influence many constituencies. So you, you're entering a very complex uh, environment. So the first objective is to raise awareness of the risks, uh, uh, to ensure that there is attention, that there is uh, good governance in this, uh, in this system, there is transparency. Uh, but there is also education. I think this is one of the key uh, elements that uh, came out of the, the discussion. Uh, and often we go back to education, uh, because when you have a solid uh, education and background, you can protect yourself uh, uh, from many of these risks. So very often is the lack of, of, a proper, uh, uh, of a proper solid education that exposes you to, uh, to risks of being mani manipulated and not perceiving and understanding uh, uh, the, the, the risks of the misuse of some of these tools. So on one hand, uh, working on ensuring that the, the overall governance in this area is, is better managed, uh, looking at the responsibilities, the responsibility of the state, the responsibility of broadcasters, the industry, and we want also the corporate sector to be part of it. Uh, but then also the users and, and the ones and the, and the education raising uh, and raising awareness. It is an extremely complex, so we bring the minority angle there but it's a, it's a much larger uh, uh, set of issues, and so this, this minority angle plays a role, but in this broader uh, context, so we play our own contribution, if you want, to raise awareness mm -hmm. uh, to the, the, the set of uh, challenges that are connected with the, social, uh, with the use of social media or the, the, yeah. uh, the development of the media, which I don't want to, cons to define as problematic, of course. Uh, we, are, we are connected much better, and, and uh, uh, I think it's, it's great that we can communicate so easily, but this uh, uh, introduces a number of risks of which we need to be aware. Right. Right. So, but I mean, thinking back upon the question of, of the, has the mandate kept up with the times, you mentioned just now that 
it's, it's sort of a multi-stakeholder approach on this issue. So you're, mm. you're actually engaging with not just participating states, but also oh, with yeah. the private sector Multiple and actors. such, which, is, which I would actors. imagine is a bit of a shift. Is that right? It or, is. Yeah. It is, yeah. And uh, um, uh, actually, I, I, uh, I'm trying to, to open up a bit more. Uh, some of the, the problems I have is that as you, as you open up and you engage with more actors, it's difficult to protect this core mandate of the quiet diplomacy. Mm. So there's still a part of what I do that I need to make double effort to ensure that I, uh, I manage uh, to, to uh, reassure everybody that uh, I'm not going you know, to spill the beans and I'm mm -hmm. not going to uh, start talking about things that are too sensitive too broadly. Uh, but some, sometimes this is a, a, at odds with the need to reach out to new constituencies and explain why. Right. Uh, so that requires a special, you know, attention, if you want, to uh, uh, how far you can go and uh, and how convincing you can be, uh, without undermining uh, some of the core aspects of the mandate. Great, right. right. very good. Okay, we're just about out of time. If there's if there's if there's one more question, I could take it. Otherwise, I think. Um, I would just like to really thank you for your uh, for coming here, and also I know you have the the event tomorrow, and I, I'm really happy to hear that you you came here in order to speak to a broader audience. It's something that that IPI uh, really seeks to position itself as a, as a as a platform for that. And I go back to um, uh, what you said earlier that the I think it was into the advice to the OAS is that critical to your managers, what you do is long term. Yeah. And I think that that uh, is really places a very, puts the, the office in a very special place. I think something that we talk about a lot here at IPI is the need to move beyond uh, responding to one crisis after the next and really think systematically about a prevention framework and that is a long term project. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that the office of the high commissioner uh, national minorities is a, is a, a unique model in the system and one that we should all look to. Uh, so thank you for sharing your uh, your insights with us. And uh, please join me in. Thanks to thank you. you. Thank and, you. And thanks to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>